what is assembly theory? Lee sent me some slides. There's a there's a big sexy paper coming out probably, maybe I don't know. We've almost uh, finished it. Um, almost, almost. That's like a, it. that's also a summary of science. We're almost done. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, we're almost done. It's the, I think the history of science. We are summarized. ready to start an interesting discussion with our peers. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're the machine that created the object, and we'll see what the object takes yeah. us. All right. So, okay. what what is assembly theory? Um, yeah. Well, I think I think the easiest way for people to understand it is to think about um, assembly and molecules. Although the theory is very general, it doesn't just apply to molecules. And this was really Lee's insight, so it's kind of funny that I'm explaining it. But um, I'll, but, I'll mark you. Okay. All right. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. You have to tell me where I get the check mark marks minus, but it's your theory as well. Yeah, so. I know. But ima imagine a molecule, um, and then and then you can you know break the molecule apart into elementary building blocks. They happen to be bonds, and then you can think of all the ways for molecular assembly theory. You can think of all the ways of building up the original molecule. So there's all these paths um, that you can assemble it, and the sort of rules of assembly is you can use pieces that have been generated already. Um, so it has this kind of recursive property to it. Um, and so that's where kind of memory comes into assembly theory. And then the assembly index is the shortest path in that space. So it's supposed to be the minimal amount of history that the universe has to undergo in order to assemble that particular object. And the reason that this is significant is we figured out how to measure that um, with a mass spec um, in the lab. And we had this conjecture that if that minimal number of steps was sufficiently large, it would indicate that you required a machine or a system that had information about how to assemble that specific object because the combinatorial space of possibilities is getting exponentially large as the assembly index is increasing. So just, sorry to interrupt, but so that means there's a sufficiently high assembly index that if observed in an object is an indicator that something lifelike created it or is the object itself lifelike? Um, both. But you might want to make the distinction that a water bottle is not life, but it would still be a signature that you were in that domain of physics and that I might be alive. So um, so there will be potentially a lot of arguments about where the line, at, at which assembly index uh, does interesting stuff start to happen. The point is we can make all the arguments, but it should be experimentally observable. And and Lee can talk more about that part of it. But the, the point I want to make about it is there was always this intuition that I had that there should be some complexity threshold in the universe above which you would start to say whatever physics governs life actually becomes operative. And I think about it a little bit like we have Planck's constant, which, you know, like, and we have the fine structure constant. And then this sort of assembly threshold is basically another sort of uh, potentially constant of nature. It might depend on specific features of the system, I, but um, which we debate about sometimes. But um, but then when you're past that, you, ha you have to have some other explanation than the current explanations we have in physics, because now you're in high memory. Um, yeah. uh, things actually require time for them to exist, and time becomes a physical variable. So the, the path to the creation of the object is the memory. Yep. So you need to consider that. High. Yeah, but the, but the point is, that's a feature of the object. Right. So it's, it's, it, So when I think of all the things in this room, uh, you know, we see the the projection of them as a water bottle, but assembly theory would say that this is a causal graph of all the ways the universe can create this thing. That's what it is as an object. And we're all interacting a causal graph. And, and most of the creativity in the biosphere is because a lot of the objects that exist now are huge in their structure across time, four billion years of evolution to get to us. So, and so is it possible to look at me and infer the history that led to me if you, me as a human, you, know, you as an individual human. might be hard. You as a representative of a population of objects that have high assembly with similar causal history and structure that you can communicate with, i.e., other humans, you can infer a lot, probably. Yeah, also with them, which we do genomically. Even I mean, it's not like like we have a lot of information in us we can reconstruct histories from. Assembly is saying something slightly deeper. Yeah, one thing to add, I mean, it's not just about the object, but the objects that occur, and not just objects with high assembly number, because you can have random things that have a high assembly number, but they must have, there must be a number of identical copies. So you know you're getting, getting away from the random, because you could take a snapshot. This is why, it's not like I hate entropy. I love entropy when used correctly. But it's about, the problem with entropy, you have to have a labeler. And so, so you can label the beginning and the end, the start and the finish, you know. Where what you can do in assembly is say, oh, I have a number of objects in abundance. They all have these features. And then you can infer 
And one of the things that we debated a lot, particularly during lockdown, because I almost went insane trying to crush the, <laughs> produce the assembly equation. So we came up with the assembly equation. I had, just imagine this. So you have this string where, oh, actually it makes me, makes me sick trying to remember it. It was so, it did my head in for a long time. Dramatic. Yeah, because I couldn't, so I was, if you just have a string of say words, say, you know, a series of words, series of letters. So you just have A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 D, D, D. And you and you find that object, and you just you just have four A's, four B's, four C's, four D's together. Boom. Then, and that really that you measured that, so you physically measured that string of letters. Yeah. Then what you could do is you can infer sub graphs of maybe the four A's, the four B's, the four C's, and the four C's. But you don't see them in the real world. You just infer them. And I really got stuck with that because there's a problem to try and work out what's the difference between a, a long, you know. A physical object in this assembly space of the objects so that we realized the best way to put that is, is infer in time that so although we can't infer your entire history we know at some point the four a's were made the four b's were made the four c's were made and four d's were made and they all got added together and and that's one re really interesting thing that's come out of the theory but the the killer when we knew we were going beyond um and, and um beyond standard complexity theories was incredibly successful is that um, we realized we could start to measure these things for real across domains. So the assembly index is actually an intrinsic property of all stuff that you can break into components. Um, particularly molecules are good because you can break them up into smaller molecules, into atoms. The challenge will be making that more general across all the domains, but we're working on it right now, and I think the theory will do that.